just just me. Okay, well, it was nice for me. <laughs> okay, last minute announcements. Kathy. Oh, okay. Oh, fall fit. Okay. Okay, I was going to point this out. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, if you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, I uh, would like to point out to you this card in the back of your pew there. If you'd fill that out, drop it in the offering plate later on. We can have a record of your visit and say thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. Uh, I do want to call out your attention as well to the, uh, a couple of announcements on the back here. You'll see that uh, next week we have our fellowship supper and business meeting. So that also means that we will have a deacons meeting at 4.30 next week as well. Um, so make sure you're here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock for that. And, you know, you should come next Sunday morning too. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and, and tonight as well. Also, make sure you notice the, the Dayspring Villa there. The uh, Arbuckle Association is uh, supplying items for the ministry to victims of domestic abuse and trafficking. Okay, it's not just that we're providing toilet paper and paper towels for just nobody. These are people, women and children specifically, who have uh, been affected by domestic abuse. Um, so the deadline for that is um, October 25th, so that's next Sunday as well. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Linda Dutton. Also notice the Fall Fest information, baby shower information, and also coming up in the future is Parents' Night Out. But I also want to point out to you the Operation Christmas Child. The deadline for that is November 15th, so we'll be collecting those shoe boxes from now until then. And there is, there's a small stack in the back that way, and then there's several um, this way. If, they're, if all, everybody else beats you to the boxes that are on top of the table, you can get underneath. There's still some under there, okay? Um, but take a box, and a brochure will help you. Uh, know how to pack that and all of that. All right? Well, we're excited you're here, and I almost forgot. <laughs> the, uh, the Fall Fest, there's a sign-up sheet for Fall Fest uh, on the bulletin board next to the nursery. I have no idea what the sign-up sheet is for. Volunteering to help with games. Does it have specific games listed on it? Just, just that you're willing to help? Okay, so sign up to help with that Fall Fest, and we'll... Uh, We'll look forward to that event. All right. I'm going to turn things over to Austin. Oh, before I do, though, I want to say Travis is gone this week. So uh, we have James filling in for him again. Many of you have been here when James has preached before, so he's, uh, he's really good. And uh, we're glad to have you back, James. All right. Austin, you're on. All righty. Well, let's stand this morning and let's worship by singing Everlasting God. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our home, our strong deliverance. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Well, let's take time this morning just to welcome each other into God's house and tell them how glad you are to be here.
strength who rises. We wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength who rises. We wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope. Our strong deliverer, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. Your comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Amen. Well, let's read this scripture this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Well, let's continue to worship this morning by singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise. and mighty God in three persons blessed Trinity Holy, Holy, Holy all the saints adore Thee casting down around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee who art and art and evermore shall be. darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in persons, blessed Trinity.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time this morning, Lord, just to come before you and worship, Father. And Lord, I just thank you for allowing us just to meet here this morning. God, I pray that as Travis, or excuse me, as James brings the message this morning, Lord, that you would just uh, give him the words to speak, Father, and give us the hearts to listen. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I promise I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> I'm used to the other guy being here. Let's continue to worship this morning, though, by singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Became sin for us. 
took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained brow this the power of the cross Christ became took the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross now the daylight flees now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life and finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross Christ became sin for us he took the blame and bore the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross oh to see my name written in the wounds though through your suffering i am free death is crushed to death life is mine to live one through your selfless love and this the power of the cross son of god slain for us and what a love yes what a cost we stand forgiven at the cross we stand forgiven Let's continue to worship this morning by singing stronger. There is love that came for us, humbled to a sinner's cross. You broke by shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness, what can deny? Through the storm and through the fire, and there is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ, who lives in me, and you are stronger, you are stronger sin is broken you have saved me it is written christ is risen 
and Jesus you are Lord of all no beginning and no end you're my hope and my defense you came to see and save the lost you paid it all upon the cross and you are stronger you are stronger sin is broken you have saved me it is written christ is risen jesus you our Lord of all. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you our Lord. Let's stand for the last chorus. You are stronger. You are stronger. Your sin is broken. You have saved me. It is written. Christ is risen. And Jesus, you are Lord of all. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time again this morning just to come and worship you. Father, I pray that as we go into the offering, Lord, we would just remember um, what you've done for us and we give back to you accordingly, Father. And Lord, I just pray once again that as James brings a message this morning, you would just give us hearts to listen. In your name we pray. Amen.
let's go ahead and applaud. That was great. I enjoyed that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. It's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that I enjoy coming back to Paul's Valley. You can hear that good piano and good singing and uh, appreciate the choir and uh, all the instruments and your congregational singing, too. I'm going to invite you to turn with me, if you would, please, to uh, Luke chapter uh, 20. Luke chapter 20, down towards the end of the Gospel of Luke there, Luke chapter 20. It's, uh, I was looking at my preaching record uh, that I have to keep so I won't preach the same sermon at, another, at the same church over again, you know, and it's uh, been a while since I've been here, and uh, so this was the 10th uh, time I've had the opportunity to bring a message to you, that's kind of the Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, and um, tonight in the evening worship service, the Lord willing, I'm going to bring a message uh, entitled The Woman Who Really Made History. I mean, there's been a lot of women in history, but believe me, this gal we're going to talk about tonight really made history, and so you'll, uh, you'll want to be here tonight for that uh, if your schedule allows that. But today we're in uh, Luke chapter 20, but uh, you know, before I read, I think I'd like to take a poll. My wife and I watch the news like you do uh, when we're uh, uh, sometimes having a meal. We're about to have to give that up because we lose our appetite sometimes. But uh, sometimes we watch the news uh, before we go to bed at night, and we're about to have to give that up because we don't sleep good after seeing some things that we saw there. But we still watch the news. And uh, there's a lot of polls on the news. People are going around taking people's opinion about things. Well, I could take a, a, maybe a poll, not slightly political, but not, not much. How many of you, within the last, uh, oh, let's say the last year, have had uh, the government do something or make a decision or pass a law or change something that uh, y kind of upset you a little bit. In fact, you didn't like what they did. Can I see your hand if the government had, well, that's okay, all right, all right. Pretty uh, touchy bunch here today, all right, all right. Now then, uh, the next question on the poll would be, how many of you, uh, when that happened and you became upset about it, uh, you talked to somebody about it, uh, voiced your opinion about how wrong it was, or someone talked to you about it and, and kind of, uh, you know, uh, teed off on you a little bit and got, got some of their anger out about it. How many of you uh, discussed it uh, vehemently or at least strongly with somebody? Can I see your hand? Well, that's almost almost a full body. Almost. It's, it's a Baptist church. That doesn't surprise me that very much. Okay. Now then, one last question on our poll this morning. How many of you... Uh, after having discussed it or having someone discussed it with you, uh, that it changed anything. Could I see your hand? Didn't change a thing, huh? Well, I think uh, you're about like most people in America today. And uh, I, I want to bring a message that the Lord has laid on my heart about uh, what is a Christian American uh, supposed to to do and to be in the United States of America uh, in the year 2016 that's coming up, in the year 2015 right now, but in the year 2016 especially. Now then, I, I, I want to put an umbrella over this thing. I want you to hear me correctly. If when I finish, you feel that you've heard a political message, uh, then I've failed or you've not listened, one of the two. If when I finish, you feel like that all that was was a political stance that the preacher was taking, and, uh, you know, the Bible talks about, the Constitution, rather, talks about separation of church and state, and I didn't come down here, I can get all that stuff on the news, that that was just another political message, uh, then again, I failed or you didn't listen correctly. And you, I gave you permission to come up and let me know about it. That'd be fine. I'll still love you. What I want to bring this morning is a biblical message, a biblically-based message from the Word of God 
on what a Christian in America should do in the year 2015 and especially in the year 2016. Over a million and a half men and women have given their lives since this country was founded in the defense of this nation. Many more, multitudes more, several million have died prematurely because of the wounds or because of their health failure or because of things that happened because they served our country and gave us the freedoms that we have in our country. So let's take a look at what does the Bible have to say about a Christian's responsibility in America. Uh, so let's, we, we look there in Luke chapter 20. Jesus has been preaching and teaching, and I'm looking forward to hearing the audible voice of Jesus someday. I've never heard the audible voice of Jesus. I've felt his spirit speaking to me, but I certainly have never heard his audible voice. I'm looking for Jesus speaking like no other man has ever spoken. And um, maybe we'll even get to an eternity, go back, time travel back, see, see him speaking and preaching when he was here on planet Earth. I don't know that for a fact, but it would be wonderful to get to hear the Sermon on the Mount, wouldn't it, and his other sermons. But uh, when he spoke, many times it was to a hostile crowd a very angry crowd. Jesus made a lot of people angry. He made a lot of people joyous and happy, but he also had opposition when he spoke. And uh, when he finishes speaking, by the time we get down to verse 18 of that chapter, he's been speaking about the judgment that's going to come upon those who reject him. Verse 18 says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken. He, that stone, will be broken to pieces. But on whoever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour. In other words, tried to arrest him. And they feared the people. That was the only thing that kept them from doing that. They would have, they, they would have been in trouble with the common folks. For they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Now notice verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement. Why were they doing that? So that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor. You see, government in and of itself is not good or bad. It's amoral. But government can be used for immoral purposes and it can be used for good purposes. It can be a blessing to people or it can be a curse to people. People can use their government to set people free or they can use their government to put people into captivity. And they wanted to use government in an evil way. They wanted to turn Jesus over to the rule and the authority of the governor. And they questioned him saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly. You are not partial to any, but teach the way of God and truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. He knows what's in our heart, doesn't he? We don't fool him by what we say. We don't fool him by coming to church on Sunday. We don't fool him by pious actions put the Bible under our arm. He knows us. He, he knows everybody's heart. And uh, uh, so he detected their trickery and said to them, show me a denarius. A denarius is a day's wages, a working man's day's wages then. Show me that coin. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the thing that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in saying in the presence of the people being amazed at his answer, and they became silent. The Christian's responsibility is to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. What do I owe America? What do I owe this wonderful land in which I live? 
what I owe for the freedoms that I enjoy, what I owe for coming here and being able to proclaim the gospel. What, what, do, what do we owe this great land in which we live? Well, first off, I think the Bible clearly teaches, clearly teaches both in the Old and the New Testament that a Christian is to pray for America. A Christian is to pray for America. Now, who, who are the people that are supposed to pray for America? Well, you would expect me to read this particular passage of Scripture. It's found, you've heard it many, many times in church. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, he says, And my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins, and I notice this, and heal their land. Another translation would say, and bless their land, and heal their, la their land. That God is looking at the United States of America as he looks at every other place, and he says, if my people will pray, it will change America. He didn't say, if my people will complain. You know, I've always found I was better at complaining than praying. I, I'm sorry to, to admit that in church, but that's true. I think I may be talking to some other folks who find it easier to complain than to pray. See, the devil doesn't come against me and fight me when I complain about things. In fact, he's willing to help me sometimes to find something to complain about. But he comes against me when I pray. Notice he didn't say, if the government will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear from heaven and bless their land and heal their land. He didn't say if the Board of Education will repent of their sins and seek my face and pray, then I will change the nation in which they live. He didn't say if the business leaders, he said if my people, you're here today, you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you have no assurance of going to heaven, your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're damned, doomed, dying, and going to hell. There's no reason for you to pray for America. You need to pray for yourself. You desperately need Jesus Christ as your Savior. I don't care what your wife is or what your husband is or what your mother and daddy is. If you've never received Christ, you're lost and desperately are facing an eternity without Christ. But if you're a child of God, if you're born again, if you're trusting Jesus Christ, then you're a child of God. You may not always act like it. You may not always feel like it. People may not always see it in your life, but you're a child of God. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility as a child of God. With being a Christian, there are tremendous privileges. But there's also some awesome responsibility that comes. See, not only is it in the uh, Old Testament, listen to me as I read to you from the New Testament. I'm in 1 Timothy here. Turn over to 1 Timothy, uh, if you want to, chapter 2. Uh, now he's writing to Timothy, who is pastoring in Ephesus at the time. And uh, he's leading this church, he's shepherding this church. And by the way, I do pray for this church very regularly. Uh, as the Lord lays you on my heart for your searching for a pastor. I have several churches that I'm praying for right now, and I pray for this church. But he's writing to Timothy, he's pastoring that Ephesus, and he says, first of all, say that with me, first of all, first of all, how many number one priorities can you have? You can just have one, can't you? If it's your number one priority, you can only have one major number one priority. He said, first of all, if you don't get anything else done, get this done. I've reached the age now that I've gotten older. I used to have a big old long list of things I was going to do today. Now I just have one thing. If I can get one thing done, you know, I've, I've accomplished something. You know, oh, I'm getting a lot of head shake there. First of all, if I don't do anything, as he said, first of all, then I urge you that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. Now notice who he particularly mentions here. For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may live tranquil and quiet life and all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. The Bible says we are to pray 
for the President of the United States. That's what it just said to me. Now, if you've got a different version of what that says and what that means, please come see. I've had people look me straight in the eye and say, I would never pray for that man. I would never pray for that man. Well, that's fine. You're not arguing with a Baptist preacher. You're arguing with the Word of God. I'll let God handle that. You are to pray for the president. You are to pray for the legislative branch of our government. You are to pray for the judicial branch of our government. I, I, you know, for years I prayed for the president and for our nation on a regular basis. But I came to realize not long ago that I need to pray for the legislative branch of our government and for the judicial branch of our government. We have a three system government. It's not just the administration, but it's a court system and it's a, 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 a lawmaking system. And so I pray for America and those who are in authority in America and in our state. But we are to pray, especially, I believe, for the leadership that is in the White House. We're to pray for the President of the United States. By the way, not everybody I've ever voted for uh, got elected. I remember when Coolidge was elected. and uh, I mean, it's been a long time ago. You know what I mean? Not everybody I've ever wanted to see become president became president. Somebody else became president. But that didn't take away the It didn't change the Bible at all. It may have changed some, some policies America had. It may have changed America's history. But it never changed the Word of God. Christians ought to pray for America. I think we need to pray that God would give them wisdom. See, every decision they make affects my life and your life and my grandkids' life. Whether I agree with them or not, they need wisdom. I pray God will put people in their life who at least uh, are not just yes men and yes women, but give them wisdom. Uh, I, I, the Bible says that the king's heart is like a channel of water and that God takes it in his hand and he turns it wherever he wants it to go. I pray for Putin sometimes. I pray for... Uh, leaders of, uh, of Mideastern countries sometimes. I pray that God will affect their lives and show them that that's only going to damage them to make a decision like that. I think we need to pray for protection. The Bible says the race is not always to the swift or the battle is not always to the strong. God's hand is what's providing protection. I think we need to pray for uh, purpose. I believe God has a purpose for the United States of America. I believe God wants to bless the United States of America. I believe God has blessed the United States of America. Listen to what Jeremiah says, and I, I think this applies to America and every other nation. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. You will seek my face and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I believe that applies to individuals. I believe that applies to families. I believe that applies to churches. I believe that applies to nations. When they call upon the Lord, seek his face, that he has a plan for good. I serve a good God. I serve a benevolent God. I serve a God of grace and mercy. God wants to bless America. I think we need to be grateful that God has blessed America, but we also need to be praying for God to bless America. We need to pray for our nation. I need to hurry on. I need to hurry on or that clock's running fast, one of the two, I don't know. We need to pay for America, too. We need to pay. Now, I don't quit preaching and going to Bethlehem, and I understand. We need to pay for America. You know what the Bible tells us in uh, the book of Romans? You're familiar with this. You've heard it many times, I'm sure. Romans chapter 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the government authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority and opposes the ordinance of God then they have opposed and will receive condemnation unto themselves. 
For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. It is a minister of God for your good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. But as a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of the wrath, but also for conscience sakes. For because of this you pay taxes for rulers and servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now listen to me. I realize our government wastes a great deal of money. That's why I have to look at the issues and pray about the issues and vote according to the issues and how they are handling our monies. I believe one of the greatest dangers faced in the United States, if not one of the major dangers faced in the United States, is the fact that we're broke. When your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep is going to be your downfall. Last year I read George Washington's biography. Did you know that he spent as much time out trying to raise money to get his army out in the field to win our independence as he did in the battles himself? Those troops cost money. Those planes cost money. You cannot defend yourself without finances. But it's not my responsibility to spend the money. It's my responsibility to obey the law and to pay the money and to lift my voice if I feel the taxes are excessive. I'm going to upset some folks, but I want you to listen to me. What does the Bible say about paying taxes? If you pay one dollar more than you're supposed to on your taxes, I believe to that extent you're a poor steward of the money God has given you. If you pay one dollar less than you know that you owe the government, to that extent you're a thief. And so you can choose which one of those you want to be or you can avoid both of them and pay what you have to pay, and what the, gov the law says you have to pay. How can you pray and ask God to bless something that you're robbing from, that you're cheating from, and yes, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go way out here on a limb. Don't expect anybody to come with me, but if they do, we'll have a good time out here. How about the next time that it's April 15th and you're getting those taxes ready, you sit down and maybe after you've finished them, you draw your family together. If you live by yourself, at least you do this by yourself. And you put your hands on that envelope and say, God, I thank you that I live in this country. I thank you that you've blessed it. God, we've got these freedoms. God, I thank you that I've got a job. I thank you that I've got some money. Uh, I wouldn't even be having to pay taxes. I'm not starving to death. I'm not living in a cardboard box someplace. And God, let this be my worship of you and help those who now are going to have the responsibility not to waste this money and make it an opportunity of worship because it can be worship. It's me saying, Thank you to God for the privileges and the finances I have in this nation. Like I said, I may be out there by myself. I realize that there's no, that a nation's in trouble when half the people feel they don't have to work for a living, somebody's going to take care of me. And the other half says there's no reason for me to work for a living, they're going to take my money away from me. The country's in a lot of trouble when that happens. And that's part of our problem. But that's not changing the Word of God. Do we take, I hear people argue all the time, well, you know, uh, this is the Bible. I, I accept the Bible. This is the Word of God. It's an inerrant Word of God. And I believe every bit of that. But there's one thing between taking the Bible inerrantly and taking it seriously. We have to pay for our nation that we're praying for. Thirdly, in taken away over there. I think we ought to praise our nation. I'm glad I'm an American. I am glad. I am privileged. And so are you. Now, I don't know what your mama taught you, but let me tell you what my mama taught me. 
was at church one time, you know, and I happened to have some candy, and the kids were coming by, and I was giving them out, and the mother, you know, try, like mothers do, trying to teach their kids, you know, so, now what do you say to the preacher? He said, got any more? You know, <laughs> well, that's kind of the way we are a lot of time. We don't thank God for what he's given us. Man, he's given us the greatest nation in history. That's what he's given us. The greatest nation in history with more freedom than any other society has ever known. And just because I love America and praise America and thank God for America, you know, I love my family. I'm glad you're sitting down because this is going to shut up. I love my family more than I love your family. That doesn't mean I love your family less or I think bad about your family. You don't blame me for loving my family. You love your family more than you love my family. I, it's not an accident that we were born in America. It's not an accident that we're Americans. That, that's an act of a sovereign, holy God who blessed us and put us in this country for a reason. So we're to thank God for America. But you see, the problem is here. And since I'm preaching about problems, I'm going to have to deal with this. In America, we praise America, but as Americans, we generally think God cares about America, and he just kind of likes these other countries a little bit. Folks, God loves folks in the Middle East as much as he loves Americans. God loves the Africans as much as he loves Americans. He spent as much of his blood for the Europeans and for the Asians and all across the world that he so loved the world. And America, I believe one of the reasons that God has blessed America and rose up America to be the country that fit so that we can help other people in the world. And we've done that. And I think God honors that. But we need to understand that we are so proud to be Americans sometimes that we think we are entitled to some things that other countries aren't entitled to. And we, you know, the Bible, you know what the Bible says about pride? It says God resisteth the proud. God, you know, it's the same word for stiff arm, you football players. God stiff arms, pushes back the proud that we need to come to America and say to God, God, I am proud of America. I thank God for America. But I recognize the fact that America is America because you've been gracious and kind and merciful and have provided for America, provided leadership, provided people who had the conviction to fight for this country, provided the natural resources we enjoy in this country, have protected us when we followed you. I'm going to read to you. You'll forgive me for reading a rather lengthy thing today, but it'll, 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 I'll close the message. I'll cut some of it off so I can do this. This is dated March 30th, 1863. It was written under the direction of President Abraham Lincoln a proclamation from the President of the United States. <clears throat> Whereas the Senate of the United States devoutly recognized, and listen to this, you believe in church and state. Whereas the Senate of the United States devoutly recognized the supreme authority, and supreme and authority is capitalized, recognized the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God, all the affairs of men and nations has by a resolution requested the president to designate and set aside a national day of prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations as well as men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions and humble sorrow Yet we assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. And to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all of history that those nations only are blessed whose the Lord is God. 
And inasmuch as we know that by his divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishment and chastisement in this world, May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of this civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a people. Listen to this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in number, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown, but we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched us and strengthened us, and we have vainly imagined that in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom or virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power and to confess our national sins and to pray for our clemency and forgive us. Abraham Lincoln. Folks, I get asked this question often, I'm going to close with it. James, do you feel God's going to judge America? I feel God is judging America right now. I feel we're living under the judgment of God. You know what the Bible says when God judges the people? It said he gave them over to what they wanted. He gave them over to what they wanted. I believe we're under the judgment. I don't believe we're under the wrath of God yet. The difference between the judgment of God, judgment is to bring you back to God. Wrath is the punishment of God. I don't believe we're under the wrath of God yet, but I do believe we're under the judgment of God. Now, this is the most political thing I'm going to say. On one of the debates from one of the political parties, the other night the closing question of their debate was this. Some of you heard it. Some what do you feel the greatest danger facing the United States is? Some answer it global warning. warning. Others answered the NRA. Let me tell you what I believe the Bible teaches. The greatest danger facing the United States of America is the wrath. I don't enjoy saying that, but I believe it. You want to pray with me? Let's pray for our nation. Father, we're just individuals, but many of us here, the majority of us probably, are people who are your people. God, we're just sinners saved by grace. It's only by your grace and mercy that any of us ever even heard the gospel, ever even had a chance to be saved. It's by your grace and mercy that you sent Jesus to die on the cross and said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Father, as your children, we look to you for mercy upon our nation and we intercede for God, may you will be done in this upcoming election. Father, Lord, we realize sometimes your will is punishment. And God, we pray that you will, Father, instead give us leadership that fears you. And may we be people that fear you and honor you and reverence you and speak about you and make you part of our decision-making processes. Father, Lord, we pray for the legislative bodies. Father, we thank you for Christians that are there. Help them to have mighty influence. Give them success in their work that people will listen to them. 
Father, we pray for the judicial system that we live under. We pray for members of the Supreme Court, God. You can take any of them out that you want to. You can add to those that need to be there. Although, Lord, we recognize that we have limited power, but may we realize that we come in the name of Jesus. May we walk into a voting booth confident that to the best of our ability, we're going to vote the way Jesus would vote because we prayed and asked you to give us wisdom. Father, thank you for our nation. Thank you for the freedom that's in the top of the list. We thank you that we can come to this place and preach about and talk about Jesus. And we thank you that we can go into our community and talk about Jesus. May we be found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. It's always in order. Mike, I'm going to ask you to stand here and receive folks that would come forward. Maybe they'll have a word of prayer with you before we close. Maybe some of you want to come and kneel at the altar. That's always in order to do. Whatever God's leading you to do, as we begin to sing, you just respond. People will move and let you by if you need to. If you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, you would thrill every person here's heart if you would come and say, I want to become a Christian. I want to follow the Lord in baptism. As we begin to sing, you come as God guides you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. just for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a six o'clock on the lady who really made history. I mean, she made it big time. God bless you.